You traders claiming I'm a Ruski agent, say it to my face and I'll break your nose. I'm sick of it. I will stomp your head in the ground, you traitorous maggots. While we go under Obamacare, North American Union, conquered by European banks, announcing our kids don't belong to us, total bondage, total surveillance, and you want to shoot your mouth off about me being a Ruski agent, I will stomp your head in the ground. Never water yourself down just because someone can't handle you at 100 proof. It's the Alex Jones Show, because there's a war on for your mind. Oh, I, will, oh, I wish we go back to the days, I'm telling you, of just getting my satisfaction out in the street. Nothing ever gets done until activists get involved. And we're going to take this nation back, doggone it. We're going to take it back for God and the Constitution. But it's only through activism that we're going to do it. And you are the reason that I'm here today. Praise God. I'm just so pleased to serve with you at this time in our nation's history. God bless all of you out there. I appreciate you very much. I have our publication here, Aid and Abet Police Military Newsletter. And I want to share something with you here. I have a uh, good buddy at one time. J. Edgar Hoover, director of the FBI, he was not a homosexual like they say. That was a lie that they built up to discredit him. Here's what he said 40 years ago. He said the individual is handicapped by coming face to face with a conspiracy so monstrous that he cannot believe it even exists. And that's the problem we have today. This conspiracy is so monstrous, so demonic, that we tell people about it and they say, you're crazy, this is America, it can't happen here. So J. Edgar Hoover said that, that it was a conspiracy so monstrous that people don't even believe it exists. And that's the problem we have today, folks, is doing that, convincing people that this conspiracy is real. But praise God, we have all the evidence needed to prove it to anybody, if they'll just look at the evidence, that 9-11 was an inside job, right? right. I want to tell you that uh, there are red and blue lists out there you already heard about the red and blue list, okay? And some people are calling my radio talk show on Genesis Communication Network and on the Great Republic Broadcasting Network, and uh, praise God we got uh, the owner of Republic Broadcasting Network, he's going to speak right after me, John, wonderful patriotic American. But anyway... I've had people calling me saying they go out to their mailbox and they find a little red dot or a little blue dot on their mailbox and they wonder what the little red dot and blue dot is. Well, it's marking your mailbox by the government so when foreign troops come in here on us after martial law, if you have a red dot on your mailbox, they take you out immediately and shoot you right in the head. But if you have a blue dot, they take you to the FEMA camps being built by Halliburton right now to house 50 million Americans. They're building enough concentration camps in America by Halliburton that Cheney's getting rich off of, Vice President Cheney's getting rich off of, to put those with the blue dot on your mailbox in those concentration camps. Now, if you go out and you find a pink dot on your mailbox, that means that they believe you'll be a good slave and you're going to go along with the program and serve our international antichrist masters. So watch for that dot. They haven't got up to our area yet because they're afraid we might catch them putting the dots on the mailbox and they wouldn't get back to their home at night, you know, if we catch them. But uh, it's time to prepare, folks. It's time to prepare. It's time to work, 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 work like we're going to win, which we are, but it's also time to prepare like you may lose temporarily. So I'm going to tell all of you, if you have not bought ammunition, if you have not bought guns, go get them now. Go get them now, because you won't be able to get them much longer. I want everybody to understand this very, very well. Taking anything 
out of the Constitution or doing anything to distort the Constitution is punishable by death. Let that sink in as you think of all the fucking lies and treason and war crimes that this fucking country has committed. When are we gonna lynch these assholes? Like there should be groups of people leaving their house like by themselves like fuck this I'm gonna do something and you know someone's leaving the house and they see somebody else leaving the house and they see somebody leaving the house we should be fucking going in arms and taking care of fucking business right now you people have been poisoned by too much fluoride you want your fucking FEMA camps you're gonna get them I want everybody to pay attention, please, to this video. <laughs> you tell me. I'm just showing you. You tell me. What the fuck we should be doing. Because it ain't fucking just sitting here doing nothing. This shit's got to end, and it's got to end now. If you can't see where this shit is fucking headed by now, you need some serious mental help. Nazi Germany did the exact same shit the United States has been doing for years. The Nazis weren't stupid enough to put it on fucking paper. And a lot of reasons they do that is to see how far they can take it and get away with it. And you're proving that they can take it pretty fucking far. These people got to be stopped immediately. They already have a major attack in this country planned. This is some of the most incredible video you're going to see by one of the most credible guys you could ever he know or hear or anything. I highly suggest you don't brush this off because it ain't no fucking joke. Talk to anybody in the military. I've seen ads on Craigslist for these fucking jobs. FEMA camp. They're not going to call them those. Resettlement centers. Civilian inmate labor camps. Shit like that, they'll call it. I'm going to, I mean, I'm working on an epic FEMA video for like the longest now. And I, I don't think it'll be done anytime soon, but it's there. I'm always on it. It's gotta be, it's gotta be kept in the, in the light, you know. History repeats itself. We got a chance to fucking stop it. So please watch this video. Check out the links below. Stay tuned for more. Not too long ago. I talked with Dale Bohannon, whom I've known since, I guess, the mid-1980s. And he told me something very interesting that he found back in the fall of 2000 while he was on a business trip. Listen to this, folks. I was pulled to the side road, which was uh, uh, a new cut gravel dirt road in front of a business. Uh, builder supply business, actually top-notch builder supply in Madison, Georgia. To my right, this was a 
previously was a soybean field, um, and this little new cut road divided this field. And the right side of the road was filled with, uh, which I thought was portable toilets. So I never looked at them that close. Same in color, maybe black, but which was an odd color. And I was sitting there going over my notes, and um, a van pulled alongside of me that turned out to be the property owner. And he greeted me, and he was by himself, and so we had a good little dialogue there. And I asked him about the, the field of black boxes what what were they? Because they, uh, I'd never seen anything like that. And uh, and his statement was that if he told me, I would be one of few people in Madison, Georgia, that knew about them. And he says they're they're uh, disposable coffins, I believe he told me. And he says uh, there's a hundred at that time. He said there was a hundred and twenty-five thousand there, and they were stacked. Uh, he told me 15 high. I, I asked him uh, who owned them, and he stated that uh, the CDC owned them and that they were leasing the land, leasing his land for storage. And um, he um, said his brother uh, worked with the CDC in Atlanta and had been asked by the CDC to do a three-year extension to place temporary morgues all across the nation. So in January of this year, 2005, we decided to drive to beautiful Madison, Georgia and take a look for ourselves. It was on a Sunday and no one was around, with the exception of this one pickup truck that was coming out the narrow road that we were going in on next to this field. We flagged down the uh, pickup truck and it was providential that the driver of this pickup truck turned out to be the son of the man that owned this field. So naturally we started asking him questions. And he told us that not long ago there had been as many as 500,000 of these grave liners or disposable coffins. We asked him for permission if we could look around and he said yes, so we did. We're just getting a, an idea for the size of these boxes. What could these boxes be used for? Well, they're called casket liners. And that's an interesting term, isn't it? It's a casket liner. When I first heard the term casket liner, I thought perhaps a lighting for a casket. But this is too big to be on the inside of a casket. So, Certainly, this could be used as a casket. This is an inexpensive casket. And you can see the size here. There's lots of room. Uh, I think my friends here, we could all probably get inside. It might be a little cozy, but we'd fit just fine. Which tells me that these liners can be used for more than just one. And uh, one more time. What kind of liners are these? Casket um, liners. Cas these are casket liners. That's what the man said. That's yes. what the man told us. And we're told that there are about, well there were about 500,000 out here. Later, as I went back to my home office, I spoke of it there and of course people usually don't want to hear too much about this kind of thing. So it's never been mentioned, uh, you know, publicly except just here and there. Uh, because most, like I said, the, the reaction I got, people didn't want to know about it, the, the, the few people that I spoke to. And so I just dropped it and until uh, I went to a luncheon, a fundraising, a fundraiser for Representative Saxby Chambliss. Now, he was running for his second term for the U.S. House of Representatives. And it was a uh, crowd probably... 100, maybe 150, it was congressmen, senators, state senators and mayors, 
uh, there was uh, one table we probably had two three-star generals and a couple of one-star with their spouses. So it was a real high-powered meeting. But the uh, keynote speaker was the uh, a congressman, and I, I don't remember his name. He had just been in the House for a long time, and he was the chairman of the Armed Services Committee. Um, and so he just spoke in behalf of Representative uh, Chambliss and the importance of having him on board uh, to be reelected um, due to our uh, threats. But it had to do with the the nuclear devices that was missing from the old Soviet Union and that had gotten into terrorist hands. And it, it was the emphasis was on the the critical state. Uh, that we face in this country, and he said we could lose tens of millions of people in the next decade, and he used those terms, due to a nuclear strike on U.S. soil. And I was sitting there, and it became very clear to me that that could very well explain why just weeks, I mean, could be two to three weeks prior to that meeting that I had stumbled upon these, uh, at that time, 125,000 disposable liners or, or caskets or coffins or whatever uh, they could be termed as in that soybean field in Madison, Georgia. Did you catch what he said, friends? At this high-powered meeting, it was in Perry, Georgia, near Robbins Air Force Base, the largest employer in the state of Georgia, Robbins Air Force Base. The chairman of the Armed Services Committee was the keynote speaker. The chairman of the Armed Services Committee, whoever that may be, used to be Sam Nunn of Georgia from the district I was born and raised in. Whoever that chairman is, is generally one of the most powerful men in Washington. And I can't remember the chairman's name at that time myself, but he said, this was in the year 2000, I believe, that in the next 10 years, possibly due to nuclear strikes, tens of millions of people could lose their lives. And we've just read what our prophet said. Now what we've just seen is one United States city outside, this is Atlanta, it has a metropolitan population area of roughly four million people. So this is one field outside of one U.S. city, uh, one U.S. city. And the brother of the man that owns this field that the government is leasing this field from to store these disposable coffins, this brother has been, was given three years to set up temporary morgues around the country. Now we found the website that we think these disposable coffins were made uh, at and we noticed that the lids that they're advertising on the website were rounded. But the lids, hundreds of thousands of lids there, the lids we found, folks, were flat and they were reinforced. You know what that could mean? You can stack them on top of each other. That's a lot neater to stack them in disposable coffins than what we saw after the tsunami when we would see bulldozers digging holes and taking bodies and pushing bodies into holes. America can stomach this much better. A map of all the FEMA concentration camps. I'm bringing you here first to give you the reality that they are there, they have been mapped, and um, now I want to bring you over to this uh, nice post by the Friends of Liberty. Uh, that addresses these FEMA camps, uh, the locations, in the executive orders. Uh, and I'm doing this because many of you may know a lot of this stuff, but what I'm seeing overall, the general public has no clue as to what the hell is going on with this government. Uh, this is a dictatorship uh, similar to Hitler as far as I'm concerned. And we saw in the last few days that Louisiana has filed a petition to peacefully secede from the United States, which I encourage, I endorse all of our governors marching on Washington, arresting Obama and anyone else like him 
throwing the Congress, the Senate, and the House all out the fucking door. We don't need a president. We need our governors to run this country. That will return power back to the people. Nobody needs to stay in Washington. We need to do away with Washington, D.C., wipe that off the map, uh, not physically, but on paper, because that's the only way it really exists. It's just a piece of paper. Um, and anyway, let's. Uh, there's 800 FEMA camps. We showed you the map. Uh, this talks about the Rex 84 uh, program, Operation Cable Splicer and Garden Plot. Now, I'll link you to this. You can go read the whole article, but I want to overview these executive orders for you for those that have no clue about how much power the government actually has. And after I read these, I want you to take a minute, sit by yourself in a dark place, and think, am I really safe? Uh, who am I being protected from? It, we don't need this protection. What we need is a lot of love to take care of each other and many of us that have balls to protect ourselves. We have an awesome military. Uh, we don't need to be going to foreign lands to protect ourselves. And these executive orders uh, should show you that you're not free, that you are a slave, and at any moment you could be made to do anything that the executive branch decides that they will have you do. Uh, you don't own anything. Um, it's just a fallacy because as soon as somebody decides that they want what you have, uh, they're going to take it. And now if this seems unreasonable to you, I want to remind you that the Occupy movement is technically a major uprising, has been going on for over a year. So at any moment, Obama could institute martial law and when we read through these executive orders you'll see that he can do whatever the fuck he wants and it cannot be reviewed by Congress for six months. Well after six months of taking everything you have putting you into a camp making you do what you're told to do there isn't going to be a Congress to review anything. So let's get into this. Executive Order 10990 allows the government to take all over all modes of transportation and control of highways and seaports. Executive Order 10995 allows the government to seize and control the communication media. Executive Order 10997 allows the government to take over all electrical power, gas, petroleum, fuels, and minerals. little side note, they already control the media. Uh, anyway, back to this. Executive Order 10998 allows the government to seize all means of transportation, including personal cars, trucks, or vehicles of any kind, and total control over all highways, seaports, and waterways. Executive Order 10999 allows the government to take over all food resources and farms. Executive Order 11000 allows the government to mobilize civilians into work brigades under government supervision. Executive Order 11001 allows the government to take over all health, education, and welfare functions. Executive Order 11002 designates the Postmaster General to operate a national registration of all persons. Executive Order 11003 allows the government to take over all airports and aircraft, including commercial aircraft. Executive Order 11004 allows the Housing and Finance Authority to relocate communities, build new housing with public funds, designate areas to be abandoned, and establish new locations for populations. Executive Order 11005 allows the government to take over all railroads, inland waterways, and public storage facilities. Executive Order 11051 specifies the responsibility of the Office of Emergency Planning and gives authorization to put all executive orders into effect in time of increased international tensions and economic or financial crisis. Executive Order 11310 grants authority to the Department of Justice to enforce the plan set out in executive orders to institute industrial support to establish judicial and legislative liaison to control all aliens, to operate penal and correctional institutions, and to advise and assist the President. Executive Order 11049 assigns emergency preparedness function to federal departments and agencies, consolidating 21 operative executive orders issued over a 15-year period. Executive Order 11921 allows the Federal Emergency Preparedness Agency to develop plans to establish control over the mechanisms of production and distribution of energy sources, wages, salaries, credit, and the flow of money in the 
U.S. financial institution in any undefined national emergency. It also provides undefined national emergency. So any reason they want, they call it a national emergency. It, it wouldn't matter. Anything. Uh, a flu pandemic would be enough to do all this. It also provides that when a state of emergency is declared by the president, Congress cannot review the action for six months. That's scary. Uh, we have no way to keep him in check. We do have a way to keep him in check. There is a petition. The link will be below to arrest his ass. Anyway, back to this. Uh, the Federal Emergency Management Agency has broad powers in every aspect of the nation. General Frank Cisaldo, chief of FEMA's Civil Security Division, stated in a 1983 conference that he saw FEMA's role as a new frontier in the protection of individual and governmental leaders from assassination and of civil military installations from sabotage and or attack, as well as prevention of dissident groups from gaining access to U.S. opinion or a global audience in time of crisis. FEMA's powers were consolidated by President Carter. Uh, and then it goes on for some of the National Security Acts. I'm going to link you to this. You can check it all out. I'm going to put a link below. We'll go there and show it to you now so that you know it's real. But again, there is uh, a petition to impeach President Obama. Uh, this has doubled in just one day, folks. Uh, yesterday there was only 500 and something. Now there's over 1,000 uh, signatures on this. Uh, we need to take this country back, and we need to take this country back in a short amount of time. Testers at this week's summit in Montebello are accusing police of trying to incite violence. This is videotape posted on YouTube of a confrontation between two groups of protesters. Or is this man actually a protester? The man and his two friends certainly dress the part, bandanas covering their faces, one even has a rock in his hand. As the confrontation continues, the three back towards the police line. And then are brought through, where they're arrested and taken away in handcuffs. These are the boots worn by police. Here are the boots of two of the men they arrested. Civil disturbance may threaten or erupt at any time in the CONUS, continental United States, and grow to such proportions as to require the use of federal military forces released under Freedom of Information Act on 30th March 1990. All material presented here has been declassified and supersedes USAD Operations Plan 355-TAC-10 of 16... Military Occupational Specialty Internment Resettlement Specialist. This MOS plays an integral role in providing a uniform system of handling prisoners and detainees. First and always, these MPs are combat support soldiers trained to fight, then also trained as internment resettlement specialists to control and supervise detainees to ensure their humane treatment and to assist them in returning to a productive life. For this job, the Army will train you to use specialized equipment to monitor activity, to conduct searches, and to inspect areas where prisoners work and live. Here, you'll train to in-process prisoners and detainees, and to brief them on their rights. In addition, you'll train to inventory and secure their property, take photographs and fingerprints, issue personal items, and assign cells. You'll train to conduct prisoner formations and roll calls, to monitor their exercise, recreation, and work areas, to prepare and maintain records, and develop written reports. After your initial entry training and advanced individual training, you'll work long hours, day or night, in a garrison or field environment, where you may practice emergency procedures, detect and confiscate contraband, and escort prisoners outside the facility. But the Bush regime has quietly tooled up to utilize the U.S. military in engaging American dissidents after the next big crisis. We told you a little about this last week, but here's the full picture. In a frightening piece of legislation that was passed alongside the Military Commissions Act, the newly passed bill greases the skids for 
armed confrontation against citizens and abolishes posse comitatus. Public Law 109-364, which was signed on October 17th in a private Oval Office ceremony, now allows the President to declare a public emergency in the U.S. for whatever reason he sees fit. The bill also allows the President to station troops, including foreign troops, anywhere in America and to take control of state-based National Guard units without the consent of the governor or local police authorities in order to, and this is a quote, suppress public dissent and disorder. Frank Morales, an Episcopal priest in New York City and an anti-war activist, said the groups listed as troublemakers include tax protesters, gun rights activists, militia groups, religious groups, anti-war protesters, homeschoolers, and various other general anti-government dissenters. Morales said the authorities know full well that a widespread awakening is taking place, especially now that the truth about 9-11 and the reason for the Iraq war are unfolding. And he speculated that the trigger event for the push to use the U.S. military against American dissidents is right around the corner and could happen any time within the next year. Under Homeland Security, which is headed by dual Israeli citizen Michael Chertoff, it has been suggested that similar models as Operation Garden Plot should be employed. Quote, oversight of these Homeland Security missions should be provided by the National Guard Bureau based on the long-standing Garden Plot model in which National Guard units are trained and equipped to support civil authorities in crowd control and civil disturbance missions. Unquote. Testimony of Major General Richard C. Alexander. Alexander Angus, retired, Executive Director, National Guard Association of the United States, Senate Appropriations Committee hearing on Homeland Defense, April 11, 2002. On 17 July 2008, Governor of Chicago Rod Blagojevich raised the possibility of bringing in state troopers or even the Illinois National Guard to help combat crime as reported at the Chicago Tribune. This same day, on 17 July 2008, clickondetroit.com reported that Michigan Attorney General Mike Cox hosted a conference Thursday that brought more than 200 law enforcement leaders together to meet with members of the Israeli National Police to discuss security issues. The meeting was one in a series of exchanges between American and Israeli law security agencies. It is also the first one ever to be held in Michigan. Now learn the truth of Operation Garden Plot. The following information was obtained under the Freedom of Information Act. The information Information herein is declassified and does not come within the scope of directions governing the protection of information affecting the national security. It took a little more than three years to obtain a full copy of Operation Garden Plot from the U.S. government. In this document, assigned by the Secretary of the Army, is hereby assigned as DOD Executive Agent for Civil Disturbance Control Operations. Under Plan 5-5, TAC-2, he is to use airlift and logical support in assisting appropriate military commanders in the 50 states, District of Columbia and the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico and U.S. possessions and territories or any political subdivision thereof. The official name of this project is called Operation Garden Plot. Under this plan for the deployment of Operation Garden Plot, the use of SIDCON-1 civilian disturbance readiness conditions will be mandatory. This direct support of civil disturbance control operations is to be used by the Army, United States Air Force, Navy and Marine Corps with an airlift force to be comprised of MAC organic airlift resources, airlift capable aircraft of all other United States Air Force major commands and all other aerial reconnaissance and airborne psychological operations. This is to include control communication systems, aeromedical evacuation, helicopter and weather support system. If any civil disturbance by a resistance group, religious organization, or other persons considered to be non-conformist takes place under Appendix 3 to Annex B to Plan 5-5, TAC-2, hereby gives all federal forces total power over the situation if local and state authorities cannot put down said dissenters. Annex A, Section B of Operation Garden Plot defines tax protesters, militia groups, religious cults, and general anti-government dissenters as disruptive elements. This calls for deadly force to be used against any extremist or dissident perpetrating any and all forms of civil disorder. Under Section D, a presidential executive order will authorize and direct the Secretary of Defense to use the armed forces of the United States to restore order. To tab A, Appendix 1, to Annex S, United States Air Force Civil Disturbance Plan 55 TAC 2, Exhibit P O R S G H, Juliet Charlie Sierra, Publication 6, Volume 5, Alpha. 
Foxtrot Romeo 160 TAC 5 hereby provides for America's Military and National Guard State Partnership Program to join the United Nations personnel in said operation. This links selected United States National Guard units with the Defense Ministries of Partnership for Peace. This may occur either because leaders of protest organizations intentionally induce their followers to perpetrate violent acts or because a group of militants infiltrates an otherwise peaceful protest and seeks to divert it from its peaceful course. Civil disturbance may threaten or erupt at any time in the CONUS, continental United States, and grow to such proportions as to require the use of federal military forces released under Freedom of Information Act on 30th March 1990. All material presented here has been declassified and supersedes USAD operations. Plan 17 July 2008, Governor of Chicago Rod Blagojevich raised the possibility of bringing in state troopers or even the Illinois National Guard to help combat crime as reported at the Chicago Tribune. This same day on 17 July 2008, clickondetroit.com reported that Michigan Attorney General Mike Cox hosted a conference Thursday that brought more than 200 law enforcement leaders together to meet with members of the Israeli National Police to discuss security issues. The meeting was one in a series of exchanges between American and Israeli law security agencies. It is also the first one ever to be held in Michigan. Now learn the truth of Operation Garden Plot. The following information was obtained under the Freedom of Information Act. The information herein is declassified and does not come within the scope of directions governing the protection of information affecting the national security. It took a little more than three years to obtain a full copy of Operation Garden Plot from the U.S. government. In this document, assigned by the Secretary of the Army, is hereby assigned as DOD Executive Agent for Civil Disturbance Control Operations. Under Plan 5-5, TAC-2, he is to use airlift and logical support in assisting appropriate military commanders in the 50 states. District of Colombia and the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico and U.S. possessions and territories or any political subdivision thereof. The official name of this project is called Operation Garden Plot. Under this plan for the deployment of Operation Garden Plot, the use of SIDCON-1 civilian disturbance readiness conditions will be mandatory. This direct support of civil disturbance control operations is to be used by the Army, United States Air Force, Navy, and Marine Corps, with an airlift force to be comprised of MAC or Organic airlift resources, airlift capable aircraft of all other United States Air Force major commands and all other aerial reconnaissance and airborne psychological operations. This is to include control communication systems, aero medical evacuation, helicopter and weather support system. If any civil disturbance by a resistance group, religious organization, or other persons considered to be non-conformist takes place under Appendix 3 to Annex B to Plan 5, 5, TAC 2, hereby gives all federal forces total power over the situation if local and state authorities cannot put down said dissenters. Annex A, Section B of Operation Garden Plot defines tax protesters, militia groups, religious cults, and general anti-government dissenters as disruptive elements. This calls for deadly force to be used against any extremist or dissident perpetrating any and all forms of civil disorder. Under Section D, a presidential executive order will authorize and direct the Secretary of Defense to use the armed forces of the United States to restore order. To tab A, Appendix 1 to Annex S, United States Air Force Civil Disturbance Plan 55 TAC 2 Exhibit P-O-R-S-G-H Juliet Charlie Sierra Publication 6, Volume 5 Alpha Foxtrot Romeo 160 TAC 5 hereby provides for America's Military and National Guard State Partnership Program to join the United Nations personnel in said operation. This links selected United States National Guard units with the Defense Ministries of Partnership for Peace. This may occur either because leaders of protest organizations intentionally induce their followers to perpetrate violent acts or because a group of militants infiltrates an otherwise peaceful protest and seeks to divert it from its peaceful course. Protesters at this week's summit in Montebello are accusing police of trying to incite violence. This is videotape posted on YouTube of a confrontation between two groups of protesters. Or is this man actually a protester? The man and his two friends certainly dress the part, bandanas covering their faces, 
One even has a rock in his hand. As the confrontation continues, the three back towards the police line. And then are brought through, where they're arrested and taken away in handcuffs. These are the boots worn by police. Here are the boots of two of the men they arrested.